I'd like to invite to speak to us uh, Dr. Ferdinand de Verin, who is former UN Special Rapporteur on Minorities. Dr. Verin, Verin's work and commitment focuses on human rights of minorities, as well as the prevention of ethnic conflicts, the rights of migrants, the relationship between ethnicity, human rights, and democracies, and the use of federalism and other forms of autonomy arrangements to balance competing cultural interests. Dr. De Verin lives in Canada and is here with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, Florence. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and panelists, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. First, it's a privilege to be part of this significant event and at a particularly critical moment, pivotal period really, for India. And I take this opportunity to commend uh, the North American Manipur Tribal Association, the International Defenders Council, the Genocide Watch, Hindus for Human Rights, and the many others who have helped organize this timely briefing. We need to be we need to appreciate the why and what of the situation in Manipur in a wider context to fully understand and appreciate where this is going. First, what the Kuki, Somi, and Hmar peoples have been experiencing in Manipur is part of a pattern of atrocities and massive violations of international human rights. And this is happening specifically, particularly, for non-Hindu minorities and peoples in India, and that what they are experiencing is therefore not ad hoc. It's not accidental. Secondly, why this is occurring is not a mystery either. Many international organizations, such as United Nations, civil society organizations, including Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, India Hate Lab, and others have warned of the social and political instrumentalization of extreme forms of Hindu nationalism, the wide degree of impunity for those who are inciting violence and even calls to genocide through social and other media, which are creating an extraordinary toxic and hostile environment for religious and ethnic minorities and peoples such as those in Manipur. And all of these have laid the ground of the normalization of discrimination, exclusion, and even brutality against those who are perceived as threats or foreigners or outsiders. And finally, where this is leading to. The foundations of India as a liberal inclusive democracy are crumbling, we could even say before our very eyes. India is becoming an ethno religious nationalist state, Hindutva, a country which belongs to and is controlled by members of the Hindu majority. And this ideology and the instrumentalization of religion, it's not about religion, but it is the instrumentalization of religion, is, um, is in the process of dismantling the constitutional, human rights, and other protections of non-Hindus. And that means removing or undermining land rights, autonomy arrangements, and other religious and human rights guarantees, which non-Hindus had until now enjoyed in order to establish the primacy and supremacy of a Hindu dominated society. Now, others will explain in much greater detail how the BJP government and Prime Minister Modi have propelled India in this direction and what this means for people such as the Kuki, Somi, and Hmar in Anipur. But what has to be emphasized is that this is quite systematic and not simply ad hoc violations of human rights experienced by large numbers of individuals. The denial of their human rights of non-Hindu uh, minorities and even persecution and atrocities occurs because they do not belong to the Hindu majority in the name and as part of an ideology of extreme religious nationalism 
And these are, I would say, to suggest to you, exist existential threats to the very democratic nature of that country. So let me be absolutely clear that the normal democratic protections and institutions of an independent judiciary and the rule of law have already been undermined. And this means, for example, for minorities such as Muslim in Assam, Kashmir, and other parts of the country, that any human rights and legal protections that they might have had are no longer able to guarantee even basic rights, since even the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court of India, seems to accept the basic tenets of Hindu nationalism as a guiding principle and has moved India away from being a secular state to a, well, to a more religiously oriented Hindu nation. This is not hyperbole, if that's the right way to say it in English. In the case that allowed the demolition of, uh, demolition of the mosque and the eventual construction of the Ayodhya Ram Temple, the judges of the Supreme Court in 2019 unanimously ruled that the God Lord, the God Lord Ram was a legal person and could make legally and could legally present claims in court. And once you start going in that direction, you are seeing one can question whether we have a secular state as such. Unanimously, the judges of the Supreme Court awarded the disputed land, uh, ownership of land to Lord Ram. There were other aspects of this case, but this is a situation where you have the ownership of land, which is a recurring theme. Now, of course, if you think about this, on the one hand, the judges really had not much choice. If you recognize God as a legal person with standing in the country, do you really think the judges were going to rule against God? Think about it. And this is a situation where it is actually um, unknown of or unheard of anywhere else in the world. Even the Vatican, the Pope may be a representative of God on earth, but he actually, God himself or herself, does not have standing in the Vatican as such. God is not a legal person. India, to my knowledge, is the only country in the world that recognizes a deity as a legal entity with standing. And in case there's any doubt, Prime Minister Modi himself described described himself as an instrument of Lord Ram, anointed by the divine to represent all the people of India. And this is what needs to be understood, to see what this means for non-Hindus and what is happening in Manipur and India. India, by the way, was ranked last year fifth in the world for the risk of new mass killings by the Simon Stud Center for the Prevention of Genocide and the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And this was referring mainly to killings of Muslims and other non-Hindus, such as in Manipur, because of calls to actually attack them, lynch them, and even to commit genocide, all in the name of Hindu Hindutva. And why you will often hear shouts of Jai Shri Ram during violent attacks against non-Hindus. Hate speech in India has often become political, violent, and usually occurs with, well, largely impunity. And it has become a tsunami of prejudice, intolerance, and violence against non-Hindus non in recent years. We're seeing massive discriminatory legislation and policies, often on the grounds of religion or ethnicity. That's what involved, that is what involved, as I've warned in a number of reports, including one on statelessness. If, as some of you may know about the a citizenship uh, determination process in Assam, if this process continues in the direction it's going, it could lead to perhaps around 2 million people, mainly members of the Muslim minority, being denied citizenship. 
We also at the United Nations, when I was at the United Nations, we raised grave concerns on the discriminatory nature of the Citizenship Amendment Act towards the Muslim minority because it excludes them from obtaining uh, citizenship under those provisions. Now, I mentioned this process in Assam because it's potentially only the beginning. Other parts of India are considering following suit because this is a process clearly which has a racist prejudice bias. Hindus are essentially not covered by this process of denying citizenship. Non-Hindus usually are targeted, which means very conveniently, non-Hindus will, will risk in different parts of India being denied being a citizen of the country and also therefore erasing them from the political scene. This is not accidental. No, let's not be naive. By denying citizenship, you also are eliminating millions of people from being able to participate in voting and the political future of the country. The list of uh, human rights violations which have been observed at the United Nations is dit disturbing. Harassment, arrest, detention, and even disappearance of human rights defenders. Usually, and this is not always obvious, usually, by the way, those involve defending minorities. Extrajudicial killings, torture, again, more often than not, involving or targeting non-Hindu communities and individuals. Physical attacks, violence against minorities, usually Muslims and Christians, in, uh, the dramatic and again disturbing rise of hate speech in social and other media, including even calls to genocide, which are, have been increasing, sometimes targeting specifically in a dehumanizing way, minority women, there's also the loss or destruction of religious and uh, property of religious and other minorities, including places of worship, restrictions on their livelihood or access to education, and the list goes on and on. We have had an extremely high uh, level of um, number of allegations of violations of human rights coming from India, involving usually overwhelmingly, in fact, the denial of the rights of minorities religious and other minorities. All of this was predictable because it is the logical consequence of extreme religious nationalism and the ideological core of what is the BJP government. It's therefore no surprise that make that you, we have more than 300 churches that have been burnt down and or destroyed um, in Manipur, as a matter of fact, in recent years because by destroying and burning down churches, you're removing the property of minorities. You're, it's a symbol of taking over by members of the Hindu majority. One study noted a 786% increase in hate crimes against mainly non-Hindus between 2014 and 2018. This hate speech overwhelmingly targets, guess who? non-Hindu minorities. The vitriol of what is occurring is actually quite shocking in its scale. It's horrific in its brutality and the dehumanizing of other human beings with an astonishing proportion coming from, and there are statistics that clearly show this, coming from high level political BJP leadership. Official silence over violent attacks and rhetoric is encouraging Hindu nationalists groups to be even more brazen in their violence against minorities, as demonstrated by a shocking video of which you may have heard of, of two women from the Kuki minority being paraded naked in Manipur last year, and the subsequent alleged gang rape of one of them by a Hindu mob. Her father and brother, I think, were uh, murdered. And there was no action taken by authorities until, until there was an international outcry, once the video became, began circulating on the internet. By the way, the video, you can still see the video on the internet. As often reported by Dalit, Muslim, Christian, and Adivasi uh, women 
Minority women are objectified and sexualized in many parts of India. Human rights defenders, journalists, activists who speak out about human rights violations against non-Hindu minorities are frequently attacked, once again with impunity, by non-state actors and harassed, arrested, or even imprisoned on spurious charges by the authorities that should be protecting them, but instead are persecuting them. And you've also heard the steady and alarming erosion of fundamental human rights, particularly for non-Hindus, has led to the US Commission on International Religious Freedom to name India as one of the world's 17 worst countries, what they describe as countries of particular concern, meaning that India engages in or tolerates systematic, egregious, and ongoing violations of religious freedom that are particularly severe. It turns out that the, by the way, it turns out that the current Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, is, to my knowledge, the only person who has ever been banned from entering the United States for almost two years, 10 years rather, for severe violations of religious freedom. There's a special provision in US legislation concerning that. And this ban was linked to the riots and a massacre which occurred when he was the chief minister of Gujarat in 2002, when more than a thousand people were killed. And once again, no surprise, most of them, almost all of them were members of the Muslim minority. As the then UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues testified last year before this very same commission, and here I quote myself, I don't often do that, but India risks becoming one of the world's main generators of instability, atrocities, and violence because of the massive scale and gravity of the violations and abuses targeting mainly religious and other minorities such as Muslim, Christian, Sikhs, and others. It is not just individual or local. It is systematic and a reflection of religious nationalism. And of quoting myself. Again, it's important to remember where all this is leading. These are not just massive violations of the human rights of non-Hindus. They are the manifestations, the logical results of an extreme form of religious autocratic nationalism that excludes and discriminates against non-Hindus primarily and has undermined and eroded the democratic institutions of the state. It is also a threat to other democracies, and I would say to the multilateral international order. Also. This explains why land use and ownership, but also autonomy, political autonomy arrangements and other forms of governance that protects the livelihoods, rights, and identities of non-Hindu communities in Manipur and elsewhere in India are under severe threat. Religious minorities, and especially uh, Muslims and others, are being, I think we can say, politically disenfranchised. And the degree of control and protection of their identity, their specificities, is being increasingly discarded, disregarded with states or territories where non-Hindus were the majority, the majority, such as in Kashmir. We're seeing their, their autonomy, their political autonomy, being unilaterally revoked and ruled directly by national appointed authorities. Land use and ownership laws or regulations are being changed so that land can be controlled, taken over, controlled, and used by increasingly by, uh, by authorities in a way that ultimately benefits members of the Hindu majority. This has actually been occurring to the extent that even of disregarding historical ownership and usage rights, some going back even hundreds of years. And that is what has happened, is happening, in Kashmir, where a state land which could be used for agricultural and other traditional activities, mainly by non-Hindus, non-Hindu families and communities, um, before 2019, have actually been discarded after the union government, the central government, uh, revoked the special status of Jammu and Kashmir. In the name of development, there's a special state Industrial Development Corporation, which essentially taken over a lot of these lands 
and actually prevented traditional activities to occur. And now that the Kashmir's autonomy has come under the control of the Indian government, it has introduced new legislation and re new regulations that changes the definition of residency and allows land ownership for millions of non-Kashmiris. And once again, don't be surprised if I tell you that most of those who benefit from these changes are, not, are Hindu, members of the Hindu majority community. The only other non-Hindu majority territory of India, Lakshadweep, a group of islands on the west coast of, uh, of the country, has seen recent legal and regulatory changes by the uh, Delhi appointed administrator that also puts control in the hands of central government in the name of development. It's very clever. You use development to actually take over land and uh, traditional ownership or land usage and eventually the government can do what it wants with it and also ensure that members of the Hindu majority either use it, control it, or obtain ownership of the land. Which would bring, it seems, an influx of mainland Hindus to these small islands. New proposed regulations would make the administrator the sole authority, the government appointed administrator, the sole authority to carry out these development plans but this, the new regulations that are being uh, uh, put into place would allow the administrator not only to lead development plans, but to forcibly evict the residents from these lands. There is also, you may have heard, recent warnings of a genocide in the great Nicobar Island for the Shampen people who live there if India goes ahead with huge construction and development programs, projects, which was planned without any consultation of the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes, a constitutional body which would normally be required. And of course, as you've heard, the violent incidents last year in May were ignited in Manipur, were ignited around the demands from the Meite uh, majority, who are mainly Hindus, to be give, given official tribal status, which would mean that um, which non-Hindu people, such as the Kukis and others, felt would allow these others, the mainly Hindus, to buy land and settle in their traditional areas. They are not wrong. The natural con consequence of extreme nationalism is that the nation belongs first and foremost to the titular nation, Hindus. And that eventually, logically, means to the control ownership of land that they, they wish to obtain. That is the phenomenon. Some would say the tiger, which the current nationalist government in India has unleashed. Gandhi wrote, in the democracy which I have envisaged, a democracy establishing, established by nonviolence, there will be equal freedom for all. He said, it is to join a struggle for such democracy that I invite you today. Once you realize this, you will forget the differences between the Hindus and Muslims and think of yourselves as Indians only. Many of us have admired India for its rich past of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity, including the legacy of those social reformers, philosophers, or writers who have had so much influence on so many of us, such as Gandhi, Tagore, and others. What we are now seeing is a perversion of what India was, can, and should be. Instead, it is moving, clearly moving towards an autocratic, nationalist, and almost theocratic state. Gandhi was assassinated in 1948 by a member of the RSS, a Hindu nationalist organization, which did not support the creation of an independent, democratic India. The RSS eventually uh, also helped propel the, to power the BJP, which is continuing this extreme religious nationalism by extinguishing the life of democratic and, in and inclusive India, by undermining the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, and the secular nature of the state. The Kukis, Zomi, and Homar, and other non-Hindu minorities and peoples face now today attempts to eliminate 
their equal rights, their identity, and even their presence, unless the US and other democracies stop sitting on the fence and stop their short-sighted approaches to adopt and in order to adopt measures and policies which defends a global rule-based system, including of human rights, in order to avoid creating the conditions for a darker, much more dangerous world. A world of repression, nationalism, racism, and intolerance, and of, and of atrocities, and perhaps even more genocide, especially against minorities in other vulnerable communities. This is what we are seeing today in India. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. De Verin, um, for exhorting the Indian government to stop sitting on the fence. Uh, I think that's a really wonderful way to end Europe. Uh, and I also want to thank Dr. De Verin for highlighting some of the more tragic events that happened. I share the stories that happened to our family, but there were a lot more people that uh, faced a lot more tragic um, outcomes of the violence that happened.